We have, we have solid financials, and I like Emil's reference this morning, if you caught it. One of, one of the things he mentioned was, in order to do a drug in the orphan space, you need a wherewithal. You need a, you need a, a capacity, both financial and resource, to get the job done. Um, and it was in the several hundreds of millions of dollars, if you recall. So that's a key message. Remember that for later. But we're in that space now, and we're happy to be there. Um, it's a little bit uncomfortable, frankly, because we have a lot to live up to. And there are pressures today that we didn't necessarily have yesterday. Here's our pipeline. We have uh, Morkio syndrome in phase three. We have PEG-PAL in phase twos, which is a follow-on product. Of very, we're very excited about that product for, um, that's a complementary product to Kuvan and PKU. Um, we have 701, BMN 701, it's a Pompeii disease product that I might talk a little bit about later, a PARP inhibitor for a, for a cancer. Um, we've just announced a CMP analog for achondroplasia. Again, this is interesting because one of Genentech's first products was human growth hormone for pituitary dwarfism, and it was an orphan product. Its next couple of products, by the way, were orphan products, interferon gamma for CGD, 50 patients in the U.S., and then Pulmozyme, or DNAs, for cystic fibrosis. Again, remember that because very similarly, Biomarin has grown up doing the orphan drugs well, and as you see, there's a PARP inhibitor for cancer. You might ask, well, why? And maybe in the summary, I'll give you a version of my personal opinion as to why. We also have several undisclosed programs, but I'll note that the two, the 701 and the 673, were just in license last year and were just into the clinic early this year. They weren't homegrown. Some of the others were. So we're not afraid to take what we think is a better product from the outside versus our own. There's the not invented here syndrome that many of you have heard about. Well, not at Biomarin. I think that makes us a potentially a, a very good partner to consider. So historically, it's going to fill in for you. I'm not going to read it all, so don't worry. It'll be all in your slides. Founded in 1997, several ups and downs. Rather than a straight line, I am, I am a program management type, so I like Gantt charts and straight lines. and da, da, da. But the reality is, is picture up and down and up and down and almost crash and so on. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But there it all is for you in black and white red, green, and blue, and purple. A central thesis for what we do is single gene disease. So you have a gene that's affected, something's missing, as it says in the bottom, we replace it. Well, that actually was the paradigm that Genentech, in my humble opinion, started in the early 80s. Oh, right about the same time Hatch-Waxman was passed in the US, 1983. Human growth hormone was low levels, it was missing in some cases. It's actually a misnomer for human growth hormone. Some patients in the US um, cannot live without human growth hormone. Um, interferon gamma, very low levels are missing. Uh, cystic fibrosis, DNA simply it dissolves DNA or the mucus that's formed from pseudomonad infections. Well, there wasn't enough in the body, DNA gives it back. Again, the replacement therapy, the uh, replacement therapy paradigm is an important one. And lo and behold, at Biomarin, that was the first few things we did. Something's missing, it's missing out of the lysosome, we make it and we give it back. It's not rocket science, it's not very easy to do, but it's an important lesson. And it's a lesson that actually the industry was founded on 30 years ago. We know in our disease area that if you find the disease and treat early, a la newborn screening, you move from a treatment paradigm or a delay of progression paradigm to potentially a prevention paradigm, and that's important. And then we're spending a lot of time, as is Shire and others, on the newborn screening area. One of the leaders of the field actually is Genzyme, and we work with Genzyme. And uh, MPS1 substrate and the test is available at the CDC today and is being used by states and countries around the world to screen for MPS1. So that's another 
paradigm for the future that I think we should pay attention to. The diseases have their challenges, many of which have been spoken about here today. Um, there's a spectrum of disease. There's the same risks as in larger products, blockbuster products. There's the same expectations. There's no lower bar at the FDA, by the way, for meeting regulatory requirements. And it costs. It may not cost $1.2 billion, but it does cost a lot. And that gets to the health and the resources of the company that's involved. We took a lot of shots on goal. I did this exercise last year, and so I'm putting it out there for you. These are all the things. The green is what worked, and the blue is what didn't. And hopefully, by the time you look at the slides, you won't be able to see any of the writing, so I can keep it. Just kidding. Um, but it's all there. And what you see is 25 programs were started, 28 indications, 12 programs in the clinic, four to phase three, and four approved. Those aren't the same four, by the way. We have a track record of developing products briskly. Dan Oppenheimer, who's in the audience, he's a VP of Portfolio Strategy uh, and was the team leader for Kuvan, will speak in detail about this tomorrow. So I really urge you to be there for that talk. But our first product, Aldurazyme, five and a quarter years. Now that's from IND to approval. IND to approval. Next one was five years, Kuvan three and a quarter, plus or minus. Um, others have done it that briskly. Pulmozyme was developed in three and a half years at Genentech. But the key here and the message is, is you can't let moss grow under your feet. You need to get the products to the patients who need them. And that's sort of a passion that's ingrained in Biomarin, um, in part created by by Emil, who spoke this morning, and his wonderful passion uh, for getting products approved and out there. We had to raise $1.15 billion to get to the point of even sniffing profitability. Right now, we have been profitable depending on accounting practices that you pay attention to or not, um, but we've decided that Strategically, it's important for us to, on the basis of the revenues from the products that are currently on the market, they're supporting the R&D in the pipeline that I showed you. So this year to the tune of about $250 million. Now that, that is another point that I'd like to offer for everyone and it gets to the issue that we struggle with from a, a confluence of regulatory pressures, Wall Street pressures, uh, patient pressures, our own pressures applied internally. There, there's going to be a convergence of all of these in the coming years and, and I think companies that get, they're lucky enough to get to our point and luck is, is an important aspect of, of all of what we do, uh, then there's going to be pressures that will even grow in order us, or for us to get to that next point. And, and the bottom line is you need to have the sustainability to do the development to have the resources to get these drugs out there. And frankly, it's a struggle for us. Um, there's all kinds of demands that um, uh, are brought to bear, and it's important to manage those well and create expectations and have that dialogue with all the constituencies, not the least of which is Wall Street. And I spend a fair amount of time doing that, and I can tell you it's not easy 